On this Sunday night, a Global News exclusive. I uh, felt somewhat betrayed by that letter, um, personally. Reaction to a top military commander making the case to get his job back after an allegation of sexual assault. Alternate acknowledgement. Deeply disappointed with the government of New Brunswick. The fallout from New Brunswick's order to stop making Indigenous title acknowledgements. Kidnapped in Haiti. The effort to help a group of U.S. and Canadian missionaries now in the hands of a gang. A filmmaking first. Touchdown confirmed. Russian movie makers return to Earth after a historic space station shoot. Global National with Robin Gill. Reporting tonight, Neetu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the sexual misconduct crisis facing the Canadian military. The woman at the heart of an investigation involving Admiral Art McDonald is speaking out about a letter he sent to top officers. In it, McDonald makes the claim he's being cleared and should get his job back. He was under investigation for allegedly assaulting Navy Lieutenant Heather McDonald during an alcohol-fueled party on HMCS Montreal while it was docked in Greenland on an international exercise in 2010. Admiral Art McDonald was the task force commander at the time. Our Mercedes Stevenson sat down with Navy Lieutenant Heather McDonald, who came forward with the allegation and has this exclusive report. It felt like a very public uh, attack on my integrity. Um, and I was disappointed to say the least. Navy Lieutenant Heather McDonald says she was shocked to see a letter from Canada's top admiral sent to military brass publicly denying any sexual misconduct and claiming military police had exonerated him after an investigation into whether he sexually assaulted her on a Canadian warship. I was debriefed by CFNIS and at no point did they say that my statement was unsubstantiated completely or that he had been exonerated. Heather McDonald says she knows there are witnesses who spoke to military police and corroborated her allegation against the Admiral. There were several witnesses who did collaborate my story. Um, at least one was the duty officer, so um, he was sober and he did collaborate my story. An important fact on a night when many allegedly said they were too drunk to remember. One or two collaborations were not quite enough to um, compare to the many. I don't remember, it was 10 years ago, I'd been drinking, I didn't see it clearly. Global News spoke to an eyewitness who was on board the ship that night, a naval officer who says he clearly remembers what happened and that Heather McDonald is telling the truth. That officer told Global News he gave a statement to military police cooperating the allegations. Admiral McDonald is alleged to have shoved the face of the ship's captain into Heather McDonald's partially exposed breasts after she lost a button off her shirt. Military police said the investigation did not produce evidence to support the laying of charges. Did not surprise me in the least that the, they are unable to charge or prosecute the most senior officer in the Canadian Armed Forces. Despite that, she says the story was well known and there are others who were aware of what happened. I know of at least one person who had been using it as a story to illustrate um, the generational gap um, of, of what is ethical and moral. While McDonald feels military police conducted a professional investigation, she thinks had the case gone to civilian prosecutors, it would have been a different story. I certainly think that the difference between the military prosecutors and uh, civilian prosecutors would have changed the outcome of the case, yes. And now she's left to carry on with her career in the military, as the Admiral fights to once again be Canada's top commander. For me, it was very jarring for me and for him, it was a footnote, you know, like he, he, it is very possible that he doesn't clearly remember that night. But McDonald has not heard from the Admiral, nor has he apologized. I would like Admiral McDonald to uh, look into what reconciliation means and um, maybe if, if after going through that process, he, he felt the need to apologize, I would welcome it. 
Heather McDonald is also calling on Parliament and politicians to take action on the recommendations for change in the Canadian forces instead of waiting for yet more reports. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Victoria. It has been a tough week for the Canadian Armed Forces. More top military officers have been put on leave while they're being investigated for alleged sexual misconduct. It comes a week after Prime Minister Trudeau said the military just doesn't get it when it comes to misconduct. And as Trudeau finalizes who will be in his new cabinet, there are calls for the defense minister to be shuffled out of his high-profile portfolio. Mike LeCouture reports. Major General Stephen Joseph Russell Whalen. Months after Lieutenant General Stephen Whalen was installed as the head of Military Personnel Command, he's been placed on leave amid an allegation of sexual misconduct. It comes just days after it was revealed another high-ranking officer, Lieutenant General Trevor Cadieux, is also being investigated for alleged sexual misconduct. So for us that have been in the military for years, it, it doesn't surprise us. Now that lack of shock from survivors groups also comes with an understanding that there are likely more accusations to come. And now people have that faith in the system that when they do come forward, they're not going to be railroaded or put into a, a box that says oh, this person's a troublemaker and, and they make stuff up. Whalen remained in his role for months, but according to the Canadian Armed Forces, Acting Chief of the Defence Staff General Wayne Eyre was notified of the investigation on June 2nd, adding Whalen was not made aware of it due to possible impacts on the investigation. The Minister of National Defence was informed the same day. We have listened and we are taking action. Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan may have this file on his desk now, but that could change October 26th when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau names his new cabinet. A June report from former Supreme Court Justice Maurice Fish found sexual misconduct in the military is as rampant now as it was in 2015, the year Sajjan was named minister. His laissez-faire leadership style has led to the escalation of those problems and, and just waiting for a review is not what we need right now. Survivors advocates hope whoever is named minister will continue to push for a shift within the military. There's, there's lots of great people left that are in, in key leadership positions that we're engaged with and we're looking very positive about culture change. Culture change, they hope, will lead to a systemic change within the forces. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Prime Minister Trudeau is traveling to Kamloops, B.C. today. The Kamloops to Shwetmik First Nation says he will visit on Monday. Chief Roseanne Casimir says Trudeau passed up two invitations to visit on September 30th, the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Instead, he spent the day on a B.C. beach with his wife. Trudeau said it was a mistake and he regrets it. The New Brunswick government has touched off controversy by ordering thousands of provincial employees not to use the words unseated or unsurrendered when making public land acknowledgements. The province says it's involved in legal action over land claims. But as Ross Lord reports, Indigenous leaders say it's a sign of disrespect. In the spirit of reconciliation, Indigenous land acknowledgements have become common in Canada. Thank you for joining us uh, virtually here on the traditional territory of the Kwan Dun uh, First Nation and the Don Quachen Council. I'm here on the territories of the Musqueam, of the Squamish, of the tsleil First Nations. Many acknowledge land that was never surrendered. We're coming to you from the Grand Hall in the Canadian Museum of History on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. But the words unceded or unsurrendered are suddenly a no-no in New Brunswick, according to a memo from the provincial government to thousands of public servants. The province and the government of Canada are being sued by six First Nations communities, claiming more than half of New Brunswick's landmass belongs to them. The provincial government says it's acting strictly from a legal position. They have chosen to put this issue before the courts and that results in us having no alternative but to function as we would. Lawyers do what lawyers do. The New Brunswick government's replacement phrasing acknowledges only the ancestral homelands of Indigenous peoples a change Indigenous leaders call deeply disappointing. The alternative that he has provided 
is not written by, of course, Indigenous people to show a respect. In the aftermath of the province's new position, New Brunswick RCMP took a stand on Twitter, acknowledging the lands on which New Brunswick is situated are the unceded and unsurrendered traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. Momentum is also growing in the sports world. The Montreal Canadiens have committed to acknowledge before every home game they are on traditional and unceded territory, taking new positions on an historic grievance at the hockey rink and in the legal arena. Ross Lord, Global News. A Canadian is believed to be among 17 missionaries reportedly kidnapped in Haiti this weekend. Christian Aid Ministry says they were on a trip to an orphanage in the capital when they were abducted. Organizations that monitor kidnappings in Haiti say the missionaries were taken by a much feared violent group. Jennifer Johnson reports. The kidnap group was part of the Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries that has done charity work in Haiti for the past 15 years. The missionaries, seven women, five men and five children, were leaving an orphanage when they were abducted. The ministry sent out a prayer alert message confirming the kidnappings, adding pray that the gang members would come to repentance. Police believe the same violent gang that kidnapped five priests and two nuns in April is also responsible for Saturday's abductions. We need to track down where they are and, and see if, uh, you know, negotiations without paying ransom are possible or, or do whatever we need to on a military front or, or police front. One of the missionaries who was taken reportedly posted a call for help on WhatsApp saying, please pray for us. We are being held hostage. They kidnapped our driver. Pray, pray, pray. We do not know where they are taking us. Haiti is again seeing a surge in gang violence. There was a brief pause after the assassination of President Jovenel Moise in July and an earthquake that left more than 2,200 dead in August. But there have been hundreds of kidnappings since, including school children, doctors, police officers, and busloads of people. With gangs, food shortages, and political turmoil overrunning the island nation, Haitians are fleeing. Last month, thousands encamped at the Mexico-Texas border seeking a better life. The U.S. deported most to Mexico and flew thousands of others back to Haiti. The U.S. Special Envoy quit in protest. Activists continue to call on American leaders to help the country. Congressional elected officials must appropriate the necessary funds to rebuild Haiti. Just days ago, the U.N. and U.S. pledged more aid for Haiti's national police after high-level officials visited the country. But Haitians plan to protest Monday, decrying the lack of security and poverty overwhelming their country. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Coming up, a look at the race as voters in Alberta's biggest cities gear up to elect new mayors. The body of a missing politician in southeastern Alberta has been found and his wife is now accused in his death. Cypress County Councillor Alfred Bellier had been missing since October 8th. RCMP located the 72-year-old's body on Friday. They've charged his wife with second-degree murder and causing an indignity to a human body. 68-year-old Deborah Bellier is due to appear in provincial court tomorrow. Albertans also go to the polls tomorrow to choose a new municipal government. In the province's two biggest cities, that means selecting a new mayor as well. Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi and Edmonton Mayor Don Iveson aren't running for re-election. After a decade of progressive leadership at both city halls, two conservative candidates are seeing surging support. Heather Urex West reports. Between Alberta Premier Jason Kenney and the province's two big city mayors, there has been no love lost, especially during COVID-19. I have lost any faith in the ability of the province to do anything. But these adversarial relationships could soon be reset as both Calgary and Edmonton elect new leadership. In Calgary, the race to replace Nahed Nenshi is very close. Polls show a two-way race between current city councillors Jeremy Farkas and Jody Gondek. For me, my candidacy, it doesn't uh, fit within the boxes, right? You know, young, socially progressive, uh, financially responsible, openly LGBTQ. People don't want to look backwards anymore. They want to look forward to a future that's progressive and sustainable. 
Neck and neck in the polls, the two candidates represent vastly different visions for City Hall. Jody Gondek has been outspokenly critical of the provincial government. She uh, has positioned herself in some ways as, uh, you know, heir apparent to uh, Mayor Nenshi. She shares some of his progressive uh, causes. But during his term on council, Farkas has consistently been at odds with the outgoing mayor. He was the only councillor to vote against the city's recent COVID-19 bylaw that made the province's voluntary vaccine passport program mandatory for businesses in the city. If Farkas wins, it's an enormous um, positive signal for the Kenny government. The Edmonton mayor race is seeing surging support for a Conservative candidate too. Current City Councillor Mike Nickel has seen poll numbers climb in recent weeks as he chases opponent Amarjeet Sohi, a former Liberal cabinet minister and the frontrunner in the mayoral race. There are a lot of Edmontonians out there you know, who are very frustrated, who are very stressed because of the pandemic. You know, there's a lot of small businesses that are really hurting and Nickel's really touching a chord with them. Both cities have already seen a strong voter turnout during advanced polls as it elects a new mayor and council in the midst of COVID-19's punishing fourth wave. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Ahead, world leaders prepare for the COP26 climate summit, but just how high are the stakes? Touchdown confirmed. And just like that, cinema has conquered the cosmos. A Russian film crew is now back on Earth after making history, shooting the first movie ever shot in space. The movie, titled Challenge, spent 12 days filming on the International Space Station. And it won't be the last. Movie star Tom Cruise has plans with NASA to shoot his own Hollywood flick in space in the near future. In two weeks, world leaders will gather in Glasgow for the COP26 conference, and it may be one of the most critical climate summits in modern history. The meetup aims to move beyond the Paris Agreement with ambitious new goals to slow global warming and limit the dangerous impact of climate change. But as Jackson Prosco reports, fears are running high that time is running out. A year of deadly floods, severe drought and wildfires have left little doubt Earth's climate is changing. It's happening so fast, the WHO warns climate change is now the single biggest health threat facing humanity. We know very well that climate change is affecting the, the pillars of our health, food, water, uh, the quality of the air and shelters. Against that backdrop, the looming COP26 meeting will seek ambitious new global targets aimed at limiting the rise in Earth's temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, where scientists believe the worst impacts can be avoided. Proposed goals include an end date for the unabated use of coal, making all new cars zero emission within two decades, and ending deforestation by the end of the 2020s. The COP26 really is the, the most important opportunity in years to help put the world on a path to avoid the worst impacts of the climate crisis. Although U.S. President Joe Biden is attending and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is expected to go, Chinese President Xi Jinping reportedly won't be there. China is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases and has hinted it may rethink its timetable for slashing emissions and build more coal-fired power plants amidst an energy shortage. So I think uh, whether or not uh, the president comes or not, I think the key thing to keep an eye on is what they commit to and what the actual uh, delivery and, and policies look like. Promises made are not always promises kept. Not a single G20 country is on track to meet the targets of the 2015 Paris Accord. This week, Queen Elizabeth was caught on a hot mic talking about the summit, clearly frustrated with world leaders. Climate activists aren't backing down, planning to ramp up the pressure on leaders who will gather in Glasgow, warning the entire world will suffer the consequences of inaction. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Up next, how a Montrealer with a spooky sweet tooth scored a big win at the Big Bang. Well, with Halloween fast approaching, it's definitely the season to enjoy spooky sweets. And one Montreal baker is still savoring victory after her big win on the larger-than-life TV baking competition, The Big Bake. Olivia O'Malley has more. 
Kirsten Lund is back to business as usual, creating custom cakes for upcoming weddings and birthdays. But this time, the self-employed baker is running on the feeling of sweet victory. Team, whiskey business. We won the 10 grand, we won the title of Big Bake Champion, so it was an awesome feeling. Lund designed her first cake 12 years ago for her Sweet 16. Since then, she's made thousands of cakes out of her home in Mirabel. The 27-year-old says she entered the Food Network competition show to challenge herself. It was honestly such a really cool experience. Like, if we didn't win, I was still so happy with our cake, and I was so proud of my teammates that we actually got a cake standing in five hours, which is insane because you literally only have five hours. The name of our cake is Monster's Playroom. The Big Bake Halloween episode's theme was Monster Babies. Lund and her two former colleagues created a larger-than-life baby Frankenstein cake with a gooey green potion and Jack in the Box Frankenstein's Bride. We have like a kind of little joke going on in our team that we all just blacked out because we don't remember half of it because it goes by so fast and it's just go, go, go. The competition was even stressful for her family. Lund <laughs> didn't tell them she won until they watched the episode together. It was just phenomenal that the, the, uh, the, uh, the emotion that we all had, you know, that that she actually did it, you know, she, our little girl did it, you know. Her family loved the scary yet sweet cake, and so did the judges. Kirsten, I mean, it's so playful. The fondant work is tidy and neat. Especially when it came to eating the peanut butter and jelly chocolate cake. Ooh, wow. Lund is looking to enter more competitions in the future, but now she's planning on using her portion of the prize money on a well-earned vacation. Next year is my 10-year anniversary with my boyfriend, so we are going to Greece. Olivia O'Malley, Global News, Montreal. Now that we're all hungry, that is Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight, your Canada is a bird's-eye view of downtown Fredericton. Beautiful. We would love to see your corner of the country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching. Donna Friesen will be back at the Anchor Desk tomorrow. Have a great night.